Americans are going broke. Welcome back to Real Estate Mindset. I have Jack here with Nobody Special Finance to, you know, here to go over some data, massive amounts of data that are suggesting that America may not be in great shape like we see all over the headlines and mainstream media. And so today we're going to go over a lot of stuff, guys. And before I go into, you know, what we're going to be reviewing today, first, do me us a favor. Go on over to Nobody Special Finance. This is Jack's YouTube channel. He's got some great edited videos. And don't worry, Jack, I'm not about to get this next part wrong. He also has morning lives from Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. Central time. I, it took me, I don't know, Jack, what, a year to get that right? My God. I'll, man, I'll let you know when you moment. finally get it right, Travis, because it is 9 a.m. <laughs> Eastern time is when I go. What did I say? What did I Eastern say? Central. You know what? You're I doing swear correct. I'm not doing that on purpose, execution. bro. <laughs> I swear He's to God, get I'm not that doing right it. one day. <laughs> There's something wrong with me. Anyways, uh, so how are you doing today, Jack? Other than me continuously getting that wrong, brother. It just wouldn't feel right if you got the time slot correct at this point. It's kind of a tradition where you butcher the time slot. But I'm doing great, Travis. Thank you so much for having me on. It's great to be back here. And uh, well, we got some good stuff for you today, don't we? <laughs> yeah, so you guys, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, basically, I'm going to give... Jack and you as the viewer, a whole bunch of data sets, about eight different data sets. And then I'm going to give the mic over to Jack and he's going to kind of break down what's going on in America as far as GDP, job market, all of these things. But one place that I wanted to start this video out is basically take a look at this, guys. This is a recent article from Forbes. Basically, an updated survey was sent out on how many Americans right now are living paycheck to paycheck. And right now, you guys, this highlights that 78% of Americans right now are actually living paycheck to paycheck. Now, when I go back and I actually analyze the GFC, I've been digging into the GFC a lot. Obviously, Jack, my channel is mainly about the housing market, so I'm always asking, what do we need for house prices to come back to more balance? And basically, I went to Wikipedia, I found out a whole bunch of information, and I like how uh, basically this first part breaks this down perfectly. And this is talking about the GFC. The problem was that even though housing prices were going through the roof, a lot of people don't realize like prices were going through the roof as well during the GFC, uh, people weren't making more money. From 2000 to 2007, the median household income stayed flat. And so the more prices rose, the more tenuous the whole thing became exactly what's happening right now. And I'll show you that here in a minute. Now, I also found this was very interesting. This was another Fed uh, report. Basically, what this is saying, they, they have five findings. Okay, so there's five different findings. Everything will be linked in here. This is a really, really great report. I love it. This is mortgage modifications after the Great Recession. So this is a breakdown on like, why did the GFC happen? And I, again, I wanted to focus on finding five. Default, and that's what I'm saying, Jack, when people can't pay their bills, that's when the dominoes start happening. Now, default was correlated with income loss, regardless of debt to income ratio or interest rate or home equity. So all those people that purchased before 2022, guess what? If you lose your job, it doesn't matter. Now, this goes on to say mortgage default closely followed a substantial drop in income. The pattern held regardless of pre-modification mortgage uh, PTI or loan to value ratio suggesting that it was an income shock rather than high payment burden or negative home equity that triggered default. And so when we go here and we look at real median household income, this is real, this is adjusted for inflation, you can see that actually we peaked in 2019, not even 2020. When we look at nominal, yeah, we peaked in 2020, but when we look at adjusted for inflation, you guys, we have been losing income on a real level, adjusted for inflation, this entire time. So while everything else has absolutely skyrocketed, our income has plummeted. And this is also evident when we look at the personal savings rate being only 3.6%. In other words, Americans can't save money. The entire wages are down. The cost of living is up. Savings rates only 3.6%. You know, right before the GFC, it was a similar thing. The, the you know, economy back then went into a spending habit, a spending spree. Everyone spent and spent and spent until they lost everything. And if we keep going, we can see this happening again. Consumer debt. We should not have had this trajectory of credit card increases. This tells me, Jack, people are still 
sold a lifestyle and they're chasing the lifestyle that they were sold because we should be saving money right now, not spending money because we're in the front of a recession or quantitative tightening. But credit card debt is skyrocketing. Now, look at this. This is also something that I, this may be the most important thing, okay? Maybe not credit cards, but delinquencies. Now, I want to point out, Jack, that delinquencies right now for credit cards are 3.1. Now, in all fairness, when we compare that to the GFC, credit card delinquencies were more at 4%. So they were higher. Okay, there's no debating that. But what I'm saying as well is look at the last decade. The last decade, the delinquencies were only two low two percents, two, you know, low two to about middle two percent. Now, the reason I'm saying that is the trajectory. The trajectory is is putting us, racing us past the last decade norm. So that trajectory is very concerning. It's saying to me, again, people are broke and starting not to be able to afford their bills. Now we already know the government's broke. We know the government's broke because of this number right here, 828 billion. This is just the start of the year. This is just up until February, October to February, 828 billion. We are on pace to have the second highest deficit spending in the history of our nation. So we have a lot of stuff going on right now, obviously, Jack. You know, on one hand, everyone's like, GDP is great. We just had the job numbers come out. Everyone was like, oh, you guys were wrong, you bunch of doomers. The job market's red hot. And like, but when we look at the job growth, it's like all part time jobs. So who cares about that, right? Let's just keep going. Um, but people are suffering. Jack, uh, I, I, I see GDP's up, right? Unemployment's low. But then why are defaults skyrocketing? Why is debt skyrocketing? Why is real, you know, doesn't, don't people need to make enough money to afford the increases of the cost to live, Jack? So you, you touched on a lot of fantastic points there. Let's, let's talk about them one at a time, right? 78% of people living paycheck to paycheck. I mean, there's only about one in five that aren't. That, that's pretty bad. And yet we're getting all these articles like the Wall Street Journal this week saying, what's the problem? It's not the economy, it's you. And then they go on to list all this economic data as reasons why people are wrong to say the economy is bad. And it, it's, you know, some of the math is factual. That, that was in this Wall Street Journal article, a guy named Greg Ip wrote it. But it's, it's entirely tone deaf because it doesn't capture what's going on among most people. Yes, unemployment is historically low at 3.8% and went down a little bit last month. But look at job quality. The job quality is garbage. And look at the number of people taking multiple jobs, people losing full-time jobs and replacing them with part-time jobs. That's misery. And that doesn't show up in unemployment statistics. And so these economists who don't touch a lot of grass are saying, oh, the problem is with these people and their bad vibes. <laughs> you missed me with that noise, all right? Because that the truth is hiding in the data. If you bother to read beyond the headline, which a lot of these economists don't, you can see it hiding within the data. Um, now, there was a pretty good quote at the beginning of the big short when you talked about the rise in home prices and without the accompanying rise in incomes. Uh, Michael Burry, played by Christian Bale, he says relatively early in the movie, average take-home pay is flat, yet home prices are soaring. That means homes are debt, not assets. Now, you could parse those words a little bit, but what he's saying is that equity in those homes was really just debt. It was somebody else's IOU. It wasn't real. As long as that debt was being serviced, that equity was real. Well, we're kind of in the same situation right now, right? Oh, the massive home prices, a lot of people have a lot of equity in their homes. Everybody's saying it's okay if the real estate market turns south because I've got so much equity in my house, it's worth so much more than I owe on it. What people don't realize is the second any significant number of people stop servicing that debt, that equity vanishes lightning fast. And that's what happened in the GFC. Now, some of the charts that you brought up afterwards shows that the, the key ingredient there is unemployment. As long as people are still working, as long as people are still getting paychecks, which most people are still getting paychecks, that debt is still being serviced. And so, yeah, even though people are taking fewer vacations and even though people are eating out less, they're still making their rent and their mortgage payments largely. Chad? And Yeah, go ahead. Um, I wanted to point out also, I forgot to point this out um, earlier. Um, I wanted to point out that, you know, going into the recession uh, during the GFC, you know, we had an increase in real median household income. And then obviously when 2008 happened, it started going down. Uh, and obviously 2008 is when the uh, recession started as well. So it took the recession to start to start you know, for real median income to go down. What I find intriguing, Jack, is real median income is going down, uh, as we can see here, prior to the recession. Doesn't that mean, 
that the potential for a collapse is greater than the GFC? So there's two reasons why real median income can go down. The first is the obvious reason people making less money, like people losing jobs, unemployment. Uh, If you bring that chart back up, but you notice the recession didn't start until after, and in each case on this chart here, the the recession starts after real median income started going down. Well, the other reason real median income, real median income could go down is because of a rise in inflation. And so that's why since 2019, we've seen real median income de- decrease. It was the same thing in 2007. It was the same thing before the dot-com bubble. It was inflation was bringing down those real median incomes. And then, you know, eventually that inflation eating away at people's disposable income started to result in people spending less money on discretionary items. Now you have layoffs starting, and when layoffs start, people start defaulting on debts. That's when the unemployment starts to rise, and then the chart steepens, and it goes even lower. So that's the thing about real median income is you're talking about inflation brings it down and unemployment brings it down. Right now, we've got inflation bringing it down. The unemployment hasn't even started yet. We still have very low unemployment. Hmm. Good point. Uh, So now let's talk about employment. Uh, I, I got a couple of numbers here. I, I covered this in great depth on my live stream yesterday afternoon. We had a wonderful jobs report yesterday, right? 303,000 jobs were added. Oh, my God, it's so amazing. Everybody's talking about the super tight labor market. And then I spent all afternoon yesterday just tearing it apart because, yeah, we did add 303,000 jobs, but they were the wrong kind of jobs. Once again, if you go into the household survey on the jobs report where it talks about what kind of jobs we're adding, It paints a totally different picture than the headlines we're getting in the mainstream press. So within the household survey, that counts actual people, not businesses reporting who they hired. It it reports people and what jobs they're working. Uh, There were some interesting things. We lost 6,000 full-time jobs last month. Now, that's not a huge decrease in the month of March. But if you go back over the last year, seasonally adjusted, we've lost 1.347 million full-time jobs in the U.S. Over 1.3 million jobs full-time have gone away. Those are well-paying jobs with benefits, with retirement plans, with vacation time, right? Those are the good jobs. We have lost over a million of those in the last year. Part-time jobs last month, we gained 691,000. So we're losing good full-time jobs and we're gaining crap. And over the last year, seasonally adjusted, we've lost 1.888 million. I'm sorry, we have gained 1.888 1.888 million part-time jobs. If you take away the seasonal adjustment, it becomes almost 2 million. So over the last year, we've lost about 1.3, 1.4 million full-time, and we've gained 2 million part-time. That's not prosperity. All right. That's people are losing good jobs. And I guess lucky for them, and I use that term loosely, they can still find another job doing part-time work. And a lot of them, that's not enough. So they're getting two part-time jobs to replace that full-time job because multiple job holders went up again last month. 217,000 more people got a second or a third job in the month of March. And that number is a half a million over the last year. Half a million people have had to get a second job. And then we've also got gig work is on the rise. Within all these wonderful jobs reports, we're talking about Uber drivers. We're talking about Lyft drivers, right? 150,000 in March, new gig workers. And that's about 388,000 over the last year. So look at the job market as a whole. Look at all this, you know, within these wonderful headlines, about hundreds of thousands of jobs added. We're losing well over a million full-time. We're gaining 2 million part-time. A half a million people had to get a second job. 388,000 people are driving Ubers and Lyfts now. These are not, this is not prosperity. This is why we get statistics like 78% of Americans living paycheck to paycheck because these are BS jobs that we're getting. We're losing the good yeah. ones, the middle managers, the software engineers, and we're gaining waiters, baristas, part-time help. Now, Jack, you said that uh, you know the, the most recent job number report for March – uh, it was March. Um, we yep. lost 6,000 full-time jobs. My question, Jack, is how many full-time jobs that were added were government jobs? Do you know? Uh, I believe in the report it was 71,000. Let me let me verify that one. I actually have the BLS survey here. Uh, government jobs was 71,000 added according to the establishment survey. In one month? In one month out of the 303,000. 
And doesn't that normally feed recessions? Don't 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 private jobs keep us more so out of recession? Would you say? Yeah, private jobs is you know mainly that's what that's what funds the government, right? Government jobs, the tax revenue from government jobs doesn't help when it when it comes to financing the government. Really, you want to see uh, private payrolls growing, and we did see private payrolls growing again. Three hundred three thousand, only seventy one thousand were government. So 232 were private. Uh, most of them were in the service sector. Um, healthcare is still a big one. We've got a lot of healthcare jobs being added, about 81,000 in healthcare. That's a function of the aging population. That's also a function of people who put off elective medical procedures during the pandemic because they didn't want to go to the hospital or the hospital was overcrowded. Now they're deciding to get those things done. So we're seeing a surge in demand for elective medical procedures that's showing up in things like Johnson & Johnson earnings, that's showing up in the CPI under the healthcare statistics. Uh, that's Jack, gonna be a temporary thing. Go ahead. Um, I, was doing, I was doing the math real quick on my calculator. Uh, uh, and let me just verify this is what you said. You said um, there are 71,000 government jobs and there was an additional 232,000 private full-time jobs. Is that correct? Yep. That would indicate that 30.6, well, until the revisions, that would indicate that 30.6% of the full-time job creation was a result of government jobs. They say that, what are we at normally as far as government jobs? I think 5% maybe, not, I'm not 30%. Sure that, keep in mind, we're talking about the two different surveys within the report here. So um, the, the establishment survey, which is what told us 71,000 government jobs, that doesn't distinguish okay. between part and full time. It's the household survey, which doesn't track okay. sector specifics, that gave us all the part time jobs added. So it's not an apples to apples comparison. Okay. Do um, are most of, would you say that, do you know if most of government jobs are full time versus part time? Do, do, do you know that, the difference? I, I know most of the government jobs created in this report were local government jobs, not necessarily federal. So when I hear local, I'm thinking probably municipal workers, right? Uh, police, teachers. So I'm leaning towards probably more full time with those government okay. jobs. I'm okay. thinking the part time gains are in the service sector. When you see big gains in leisure and hospitality, right? That's hotel and restaurant workers. That's where your part time work is coming in. Okay. Thank you, brother. Sorry to interrupt. All right. So from a real estate perspective, right, we talked about how it's really the fact that people are still able to service that debt cost, barely 78% of them living paycheck to paycheck because most of them are now working part time twice. Uh, it's all about how much longer are they going to be able to make those payments? When did the default start? When did the foreclosures start? And so for that, we need clues on what's going on with the employment. And we saw some anecdotes in this last week or so. And I just want to bring up this one. This one just hit the tape yesterday, 99 cent only store, closing 371 stores, laying off 14,000 staff after a difficult decision. They're basically saying inflation put the dollar store out of business here. So there's 14,000 people, almost all part-time workers that are about to lose their jobs. Now that hasn't hit these unemployment statistics yet. And this is just one anecdote within the larger economy. But this kind of shows you Again, harken back to your chart showing real median incomes. Inflation causes those incomes to drop first, but eventually that inflation leads to unemployment, and then the median incomes drop even faster. Stories like this are starting to add to the rise in unemployment. Now, well, I also saw something interesting I talked about on my channel this week. Uh, I was watching the earnings and Dave and Buster's, the, the restaurant company, they posted their earnings. They were terrible earnings, but the stock went up because they're buying back stock. But they reported a 7% decline in their same store sales at Dave and Buster's. All right, it was you know, a really expensive restaurant. They have all the video games and everything there. So it made me kind of look into restaurants because part-time work has been most of the job gains that we've seen. And I found these statistics, this is from the National Restaurant Association. And this chart was pretty telling to me. Uh, these bars, the difference between the red and the blue bars, the blue bars are the number of restaurant operators reporting same store sales that were higher than a year ago. And okay. then the red bar is same store sales that were lower than a year ago. Okay. And these are going all the way back. Each one of these, each pair of bars here is a month, a monthly snapshot. So if you go back for almost all of 2023, you can see here mm -hmm. the blue bars are bigger than the red bars. Most yeah, meaning, restaurants were meaning they were making money on a year-over-year -year basis. They were making more money 
right? Yes, the same yes. restaurant was making more money in 23 right. versus 22. And now it wasn't all of them, but it was well over half, right? More restaurants yeah. were reporting better business than worse business. Now you'll notice that changed in January. Now mm -hmm. we've got the January and February numbers. Now we've got more restaurants are starting to report a decline in same store sales. And there's that talking point I just gave you about Dave and Buster's. That's among those red bars there. Now there's another statistic that the Restaurant Association puts out, and that's this one, kind of operates the same way, right? Red bars is reporting lower, blue bars is reporting higher. But now we're talking about customer traffic, the number of people coming into the restaurant. And you'll notice almost all throughout 2023, and remember from that last chart, most restaurants were reporting higher same store sales. You're right. They were all reporting lower traffic. Fewer inflation. people coming into the restaurant. Yes, inflation. They were raising the menu prices, and it was making the restaurant look more profitable. The restaurant was more profitable. It was just inflation. It wasn't more people eating out. Actually, people were being priced out of eating out because of inflation. And now again, January and February, big change. All of a sudden, the red bars are now a lot bigger than the blue bars, and we've got much less customer traffic. So what these two charts are telling me is that last year, inflation was masking a problem of fewer mm -hmm. people being able to afford restaurants. And now that the problem is getting even worse in January and February, the restaurant owners can no longer raise their menu prices to offset fewer people eating at the restaurant. It's become too big a problem. That tells me a lot of these restaurants are about to start laying people off. Yeah, And that tells me these part-time jobs between this chart and the story about the 14,000 people getting laid off at the dollar stores, along with some other comments about wage pressures that we've seen in some of the PMI reports recently, this tells me these part-time jobs are not going to be there much longer. All these wonderful jobs reports that over the last year have all been driven by a loss in full-time jobs being hidden by an increase in part-time jobs. And leisure and hospitality has been the biggest category with those part-time job growth. It's not going to be there much longer. And that tells me this thing about the employment. When the income goes away, that's when the foreclosures start. And now yeah. we're back to your chart that you just showed me. Let me break down what you just said. That I, By the way, thank you for that data set. I haven't looked at that. Essentially, what that saying is, is well, the only reason that there were, you know, 2023 looked good was because of inflation. And we look at deficit spending from the government like we just showed. That's exactly what happened in 2023 was inflation. And so as, you know, 2024 plays out, it's, it's starting to sound and seem like the effects of inflation are starting to kind of wear off or rather the lag effects of burning the quantity of time, burning the inflation out of the system, it's starting to be felt. And so, Jack, do you believe, you know, as a result of, you know, 78% 78, 78 roughly, based on that survey, are broke? I mean, do you think that in the lack of wage growth during the price run-up, uh, the overwhelming investor demand, and honestly, I didn't read that, but one of the primary causes of when I was reading this report about the GFC was not subprime loans. A lot of people mistake subprime loans. Subprime loans accounted for 20% or less of mortgages. It was the prime loans, and it started with investors. In fact, reports are saying investors speculating during the GFC had a greater bearing on the collapse than subprime freaking mortgages. And so now that investor demand is higher than the GFC, it stands to reason you know, that they're going to feel the quantitative tightening eventually. Do you think that we're going to have a, you know, do you think we're going to have a disinflation situation or do you think that we will enter a deflationary situation, meaning to the viewers, prices will go down? And do you think, Jack, because what we know is, is when deflation happens, when prices of assets go down, it can start a domino effect of collapse. And that domino effect of collapse is far reaching and very difficult to stop. Do you think they're going to be able to stop it, Jack? Uh, yes, they can stop it, but they can only stop it by making an even bigger problem or making existing problems of inflation worse. And that right now you're, you're watching gold is running like crazy to all time highs. Mm -hmm. That's the market saying we think they're going to do this again. We think they're going to zerp and burr zero interest rate policy plus money printing. Uh, that's why even though interest rates have risen in the last few months and the dollar has strengthened in the last few months, we're seeing gold go up despite those things that are traditionally considered headwinds for gold, 
Gold is rallying because it knows the central bank is probably just going to rip everybody off via inflation again, and that's why gold is rallying. Now, you talked about the investors, you know, over speculation is what really made the GFC so bad. Maybe it was subprime mortgages defaulting that started the avalanche, but it was the investors deleveraging that was the main, most of that volume tumbling down the hill was investors losing money. It was subprime that started it, but it wasn't all subprime that crashed. It was everything crashed. Well, we kind of got the same thing, don't we, right? We got, we have Airbnb bros, right? People <laughs> bragging about their hundreds of doors. Well, those guys are all going to liquidate when prices start falling or when they can no longer rent. You've got Blackstone and private equity firms buying up single family residential. So it's it's investor speculation driving home asset values. Absolutely. Uh, and my personal opinion is those business models won't work if people can't afford to patronize them. Right. And we're already seeing that with Airbnbs. And I think we're going to eventually see that with these private equity firms that are buying these homes. So. To answer your question, will we see a disinflationary or even a deflationary spiral? It's a question of if, not will we. If the Fed doesn't cut rates and if they don't start expanding the money supply via one method or another, then yes, we will absolutely see a disinflationary spiral or even a deflationary spiral. It, it is inevitable. But that's if the Fed doesn't. And right now, gold is telling us the market thinks the Fed will. And that's why people are pre-positioning for gold. They're expecting inflation to get worse. They're buying up gold. And you know, here we are talking about rate cuts with the stock market at all-time highs, with homes at all-time highs, home unaffordability at all-time highs, Bitcoin surging around 70,000. And we're talking about easing monetary policy in this scenario. So it's not surprising to see gold rallying here because people know the only way they're going to be able to stop this is by currency debasement. If I, if I can if I can get your opinion on something Jack that I, I think is is very interesting to me and I want to point this out to the viewers you know again looking at deficit spending here you know what's interesting Jack is they didn't even start deficit spending really until 2008 if you look 2007 it was only 0.16 trillion so they didn't even start deficit spending or rather what what I'm saying is inflation money pr inflation money printing inflation money printing same thing and so you know I find it like I don't know what's going to happen next, Jack. I mean, their money printing, it, the, the, the deficit spending is going up, not down, and we're not in a recession. And so my question is, why would they stimulate the economy more when they're already stimulating the economy and, and they're actually they're, they're increasing the stimulation? So under what you know, premise – would they cut rates and start? I mean, I mean, I mean, other, you know, I think it's commercial real estate, black swan collapse, right? But why would they, you know, when they cut rates, they stimulate. Why would they stimulate when we're battling inflation and it's off the chains? In, in my personal opinion, you know, their dual mandate of fighting inflation and maximizing employment is horse manure. It's really just about inflating asset bubbles to the benefit of the of the wealthy. And you know, the second that asset bubble shows any little bit of wobbliness, they just turn on the money printers right away. Instantly, they turn them on. And yet when inflation is starting to get worse, they tell us, don't worry, it'll be transitory. It passes 2%. Yeah. Don't worry, it's temporary. 3%. It's temporary. 4%. It's temporary. 9%. Okay, now we're going to do something about it now that you're already screwed. And yet when there's any problems in the stock market, they instantly turn on the money printers. All right. So are, do they really care about that dual mandate of maximum employment and price stability? Or is it really just about inflating bubbles? Well, I think it's about saving the banks from the government's bad spending habits, but I won't go there. Um, good points, man. And I wanted to I wanted to you know add to a point that we were talking about earlier with the speculation during the GFC. And again, we have reports and data uh, you know, up to about 50 percent of homes in certain areas were purchased by investors similar now it's actually worse now uh, but right now Jackie you know, it's interesting that a lot of those deals the investor speculation deals of the last two what three to four years only worked with three two and three percent interest rates and and then even then some of them only worked on the basis of short-term rental or STR or Airbnb and so not only are the higher interest rates gonna wane on them uh, Prices lowering would also win on investors, but also additional enforcement of the existing laws of Airbnb. And I say existing laws because in some places like New York, Las Vegas, there's already laws. We already have laws saying you can't do this. But the key 
is the enforcement. And so 2024 is kind of like that year where, all right, all hands on deck, it's time to enforce the laws that we already have. And, and, you know, case in point, Dallas extended to June. You know, Dallas, I was like, yeah, Dallas, Texas, we're going to go, we're going to get and see, I understand we don't want the government coming in and messing with the housing market, but I also don't want a hotel living next to my SF, my single family residence. I, I, I think that's wrong. I think it's taking advantage of a loophole. If you want to do a long term rental next to my house, so be it. But having a hotel with people potentially around the clock overnight, they don't care if they upset me. They're gone tomorrow. I just don't like that. I think that's I, I think that's yucky. Uh, and so we have that going on as well. We have institutional investors that are net sellers now. Um, and then we have an overwhelming amount of new uh, first time home buyers that are coming back into the market in like record uh, paces right now because they're the only ones. And I hate to say this foolish enough to buy right now. And so to me, these are all signs of the bubble getting worse, unaffordability getting worse, more and more Americans becoming broke because what we should see, if we're responsible, Jack, we should see the opposite of these things happening. Okay, quantitative tightenings here. Let's buckle down. Let's save our money. You know, and look back in the 70s and 80s when things got tough. This is crazy, Jack. When we went into recession, the savings rate went up. If you look at the 70s and 80s, often the savings rate was like teens, like 12, 13, 14 percent. So I don't understand the America that we live in right now, except for the fact that no one gives a crap anymore about discipline, getting ahead, being patient. It's just spend, 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 spend. And on my anniversary, I just, uh, I had my 10 year anniversary, Jack, uh, a couple months ago. And we went to some restaurant and the restaurant was inside of a mall. And I noticed as soon as we got out, it was a movie theater. When we got out of the movie theater, I looked up and the entire mall was full. Now, a lot of people have, I've heard comments like, Travis, there's, people are still spending money at the mall. There can't be a recession. I'm like, that's not the indicator, you fools. Like, and, and, but what I thought is, that's why we have the problem to begin with. All of those people that packed out of the, the malls, they should be saving, saving their money, preparing for slowdown, potential unemployment, and for wages to go down. What they should not be doing is trying to match the lifestyle that they had during COVID. Whereas we got printed money, we didn't have to save our money because you know six months goes by and the government's printing us another $5,000. That's not real, that's not normal. And so now we have these prices high. And now like if they're gonna come to bail us out, to bail out the markets, Jack, I don't see how they could do that because there's still too much inflation to begin with. Wouldn't them turning on the printers just make things worse at this point, Jack? Yes. Yes, it's going to make it much worse. Um, but remember, inflation follows a predictable path. First, it hits asset prices. Then it hits consumer prices. Finally, it hits wages. We're, we're in the final stages of the prior spat of inflation right now. We're just finishing that. We've, we're just now starting to see wage growth exceed inflation. Right? We had the big pilot strikes last year and the UPS drivers, the auto workers got big raises. Now we're starting to see pretty decent wage gains in the service sector, higher than the rate of inflation, just barely. Right? So we're, we're at the tail end of that prior inflation cycle, and already the next inflation cycle is starting. We're already seeing the assets reinflate here. And you know we're seeing things like Oh, we're going to have this new program to give $20,000 tax credits to people so they can buy a first time home. That is the government borrowing debt spending money to inflate an asset bubble. And they're telling people, you're welcome. It's the stupid stimmies all over again. You know, and it's their, their vote buying because it's an election year. But giving people money to buy houses is going to make houses more expensive. That's more money that's going to chase. You're, you're funneling money into an asset bubble when you do that. And so they're so predictable. Most people, when the government offers them money, they think they're being given something. They're not. Like I hope by now the average person understands that $600 stimulus check was not a gift. They stole from you when they gave that to you. You got 600 bucks, but how much has your cost of living gone up because of it? Way more than 600 bucks. So when the government gives you stimmies, they are stealing from you. You must understand that. And you know, with these programs, they're like, yeah, we're going to help make homes more affordable. Please, the, the worst thing the government could ever do 
is to try to make something more affordable. Look what they've done with housing, with healthcare, with college. Everything they try to make more affordable, they make even more out of reach. And ultimately, it's debt in the average person who's going to pay for it. Um, and one more quick point. You mentioned the uh, enforcing the laws already on the books when, with regards to the Airbnbs and you know the speculation in housing. I would also add the occupancy laws. And mortgage fraud, our friend Melody Wright has talked yeah. about this a lot on her channel. Yeah. A lot of people are taking out FHA loans to buy Airbnbs, claiming their primary residence when we know these are short-term rental, you know, uh, tenant, not tenant, they're investment properties, not primary residences. That's mortgage fraud. Right? Yes. So letting that go unprosecuted, unpunished is also inflating asset prices. Yes. Yes. And, and when I dug into the report on how, and I, and I briefly showed the viewers that um, the reason why the investors beat out subprime as far as the magnitude of like the impact on the collapse was because of the fraud, occupancy fraud. You, you had people purchasing primary residences. I mean, sorry, you had people purchasing investment properties at prim as primary residences because the financing was much more favorable when it came to an investment property. You have to have 20% down, just depending on some things. 20% down, your rate is higher. But if it's your primary residence and you're going back to the GFC, you can get it for no money out of your pocket, Jack. So you're talking about, okay, I can, I can lie. Everyone's lying anyway, so let me just lie. I can just get this house and no money out of my pocket. Or... And have a lower rate, or I could do things the right way. I could pay 20% down and have a higher interest rate. And they chose to cut the corner, commit fraud. And so that report says, hey, don't let it happen again. I mean, Case Schiller, uh, you know, Robert Schiller went to Congress and said, we got to figure out the bubble problem. Because when people get it in their mind where house values never go down, they just keep buying. It, it, it breaks fundamentals. It's because of society. It's because of the emotion. But eventually people wake up and the system collapses and nothing has changed since the GFC. In fact, I'll say, Jack, things are much worse right now. The only thing is there's no blood in the street. People want to see blood in the street. They're like, no, nah, nothing's wrong unless there's blood in the street. Well, there's blood in the street. It's being swept up. It's being sucked up like a vacuum. There's The, the second blood hits the streets, it's gone. It's cleaned up. You can't see the blood in the street because they're cleaning it every single day in the form of inflation. Inflation's the soap cleaning the blood. It is what it is. The blood still exists. It's really hard. People are going broke. Jack, can you end us out of here, man? What, what do you want? Any, any final comments, man? Any points you want to bring back up? We wouldn't even be having this conversation right now if they didn't rescue the banks that didn't deserve to be rescued last year. All right? yeah. When Silicon Valley Bank failed, they evoked the systemic risk exemption. All right. They said Silicon Valley Bank was too big to fail. Now, Silicon Valley Bank was nowhere near the size of the big banks. All right. If Silicon Valley Bank was too big to fail, that means almost all of the banks are too big to fail. And the reason they did it was because of well-connected private equity funds who had all their money in that bank. All these big tech startups in Silicon Valley, they had their private equity and their venture capitals. They gave them hundreds of millions of dollars for stake in their big AI startup or whatever they're doing. They put all that money in Silicon Valley Bank. Silicon Valley Bank lost the money. And the law said the FDIC only has your back up to 250000 So all those companies should have only gotten 250000 from the FDIC. Instead, the FDIC says, nope, Silicon Valley Bank is too big to fail. And therefore, the taxpayers are going to make you whole in your entirety. The poor bailed out the rich in Silicon Valley Bank. It was 2008 all over again. And they did it using this exception that was written in the law. And you know, here we are a year later, home prices going up again. Inflation is still stubbornly high. We would have lower home prices. The home, the, you know, we'd have higher unemployment also. It wouldn't be all unicorns and rainbows. There would be pain. But we wouldn't be talking about this affordability crisis in the same context now because those, price, those home prices, those home values would already be falling. And the people who were responsible, who saved their money, would be buying those assets on the cheap now. But no, we had to bail out Wall Street. We had to bail out Silicon Valley. We had to evoke the systemic risk exemption. Again, they will inflate every time like that instantly. Yeah, I mean, you know, and another thing is um, this sucks, man. It's like they learned for this, like the, the powers of be learned how to continue screwing us because of what they learned from the GFC. They learned literally how to continue to screw us. 
for longer. And I'm sure when this is all said and done, Jack, the wage you know gap is going to be out of control. Like it already, it's going to be even more out of control. But you know, here's what I'd like to tell to the viewers, and I want you to have the last word again, uh, Jack. But uh, and maybe you can advise to consumers. But what I would like to say is, someone that lost everything during the GFC. Okay, I had a foreclosure repo bankruptcy tax lien for over a hundred thousand as a result of my foreclosure it was really hard times, very depressing. Uh, you know, and, and I saw deals all over the place. I just couldn't do, take advantage of it because I had no purchasing power because I lost everything. Uh, but one thing I look back, what could I have done differently? Rebudget. If I would have repurposed my money six months before I lost everything, I would be a completely different person today. Just six months before I lost everything. And so what I'm saying to you, the viewer, is if you're stressed, if you have anxiety, just understand what we're saying is not too late. We're not in recession yet. You, you, you know, there's not an overwhelming amount of blood in the street. You can still rebudget. You could still spend differently. You could still purpose how you're spending to get ahead of this. And you know, even if you don't agree with everything I'm saying, what's the harm in getting ahead? Sometimes the only way to get ahead is to sacrifice your hobbies or your desires so that you can get your your goals in the future. And so I would say, you know, rebudget, repurpose your money. Jack, what do you have? What do you have uh, to say to, um, to the viewers, man? Uh, I would also say that his, you know, right now you're, you're talking about blood in the streets and it's, it's important to realize these are the good times. All right. I, I don't know if there's, there's, there's poop in the streets. I don't know that there's blood in the streets, but if you walk down the street in any U S city right now, there is some, some stuff in the streets. Um, these are the good times guys. <laughs> 3.8% unemployment. The, the bad times have not even started yet. And historically, in the last few recessions, the big jumps, the big spikes in unemployment happen within six to 12 months following the first interest rate cut from the Federal Reserve. We haven't even had the first one yet. So it's important to know, guys, like we're we're not in the opening innings of a recession. We are, it hasn't even begun yet. But all these things that they're doing – the, the financing programs to make things more affordable, the big deficits, all these things they're doing right now, it's it's just like how we used to dump our garbage in the ocean, right? The ocean was this giant unfillable hole. You could put it on a barge, sail it out there and dump it, and the problem's just gone. Debt spending and inflationary monetary policy are the same way. It's this giant unfillable hole. It'll never be a problem. And by the time the hypodermic needles and the six-pack wrappers are washing up on your shore, it's already too late. So Right, right. But it doesn't have to be too late. It doesn't I mean, have to be. You, you mean literally all it takes a lot of times, obviously, minus medical stuff and, 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 and these other things, is usually, Jack, it just takes a decision. You can literally, if you're a viewer, you can decide right now, right now to change your life. I mean, that's the advantage of being a human being. We have a free will. We can adapt. We can maneuver. We can grow and we could do that together. Now, uh, real quick, guys, I'm going to let you guys go. Don't forget, if you found value in this video, like this video. And when you're done liking this video, don't forget to go to Jack's channel, Nobody Special Finance. Check him out again. It is 9 a.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. Nailed that, Jack. Now, other than that, Nailed guys, it. if you're out there investing in real estate, you know that we wish you luck and we hope you win.